The Diary of a Madman by Guy de Maupassant Read by Alan Davis Drake This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He was dead. The head of a high tribunal, the upright magistrate, whose irreproachable life was a proverb in all the courts of France. Advocates, young counsellors, judges, had saluted, bowing low in token of profound respect, remembering that grand face, pale and thin, illuminated by two bright, deep-set eyes. He had passed his life in pursuing crime and in protecting the weak. Swindlers and murderers had no more redoubtable enemy, for he seemed to read in the recesses of their souls their most secret thoughts. He was dead, now, at the age of eighty-two, honored by the homage and followed by the regrets of a whole people. Soldiers in red breeches had escorted him to the tomb, and men in white cravats had shed on his grave tears that seemed to be real. But listen to the strange paper found by the dismayed notary in the desk where the judge had kept filed the records of great criminals. It was titled, Why? June 20, 1851 I have just left court. I have condemned the Blondie to death. Now why did this man kill his five children? Frequently one meets with people to whom killing is a pleasure. Yes, yes, it should be a pleasure. The greatest of all, perhaps, for is not killing most like eating? To make and to destroy. These two words contain the history of the universe, the history of all worlds, all that is, all. Why is it not intoxicating to kill? June 25. To think that there is a being who lives, who walks, who runs. A being. What is a being? An animated thing which bears in it the principle of motion, and a will ruling that principle. It clings to nothing, this thing. Its feet are independent of the ground. It is a grain of life that moves on the earth, and this grain of life coming I know not whence, one can destroy at one's will. Then nothing, nothing more. It perishes. It is finished. June 25. Why, then, is it a crime to kill? Yes, why? On the contrary, it is the law of nature. Every being has the mission to kill. He kills to live, and he lives to kill. The beast kills without ceasing, all day, every instant of its existence. Man kills without ceasing, to nourish himself. But since, in addition, he needs to kill for pleasure, he has invented the chase. The child kills the insects he finds, the little birds, all the little animals that come in his way. But this does not suffice for the irresistible need to massacre that is in us. It is not enough to kill beasts. We must kill man, too. Long ago this need was satisfied by human sacrifice. Now the necessity of living in society has made murder a crime. We condemn and punish the assassin. But as we cannot live without yielding to this natural and imperious instinct of death, we relieve ourselves from time to time by wars. Then a whole nation slaughters another nation. It is a feast that maddens armies and intoxicates the civilians, women, and children, who read, by lamplight, at night, the feverish story of massacre. And do we despise those picked out to accomplish these butcheries of men? No. They are loaded with honors. They are clad in gold and in resplendent stuffs. They wear plumes on their heads and ornaments on their breasts, and they are given crosses, rewards, titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, cheered by the crowd, solely because their mission is to shed human blood. 
They drag through the streets their instruments of death, and the passer-by, clad in black, looks on with envy. For the kill is the great law put by nature in the heart of existence. There is nothing more beautiful and honorable than killing. June 30. To kill is the law, because nature loves eternal youth. She seems to cry in all her unconscious acts. Quick, quick, quick! The more she destroys, the more she renews herself. July 3. It must be a pleasure, unique and full of zest, to kill. To place before you a living, thinking being. To make therein a little hole, nothing but a little hole. And to see the red liquid flow, which is the blood which is the life, and then to have before you only a heap of limp flesh, cold, void of thought. August 5. I, who have passed my life in judgment, condemning, killing by words pronounced, killing by the guillotine, those who had killed by the knife, if I should do, as all the assassins whom I have smitten have done, I... I, who would know it? August 10. Who would ever know? Who would ever suspect me? Especially if I should choose a being I had no interest in doing away with. August 22. I could resist no longer. I have killed the little creature as an experiment, as a beginning. Jean, my servant, had a goldfinch in a cage hung in the office window. I sent him on an errand, and I took the little bird in my hand, in my hand, where I felt its heart beat. It was warm. I went up to my room. From time to time, I squeezed it tighter. Its heart beat faster. It was atrocious and delicious. I was nearly choking it, but I could not see the blood. Then I took scissors, short nail scissors, and I cut its throat in three strokes, quite gently. It opened its bill. It struggled to escape me, but I held it. Oh, I held it. I could have held a mad dog, and I saw the blood trickle. And then I did as assassins do, real ones. I washed the scissor and washed my hands. I sprinkled water and took the body, the corpse, to the garden to hide it. I buried it under a strawberry plant. It will never be found. Every day I can eat a strawberry from that plant. How one can enjoy life when one knows how! My servant cried. He thought his bird flown. How could he suspect me? Ah! August 25 I must kill a man. I must. August 30. It is done. But what a little thing. I had gone for a walk in the forest of Vernes. I was thinking of nothing, literally nothing. See? A child on the road, a little child eating a slice of bread and butter. He stops to see me pass and says, Good day, Mr. President. And the thought enters my head, Shall I kill him? I answer, You are alone, boy? Yes, sir. All alone in the wood? Yes, sir. The wish to kill him intoxicated me like wine. I approached him quite softly, persuaded that he was going to run away. And suddenly I seized him by the throat. He held my wrists in his little hands, and his body writhed like a feather on the fire. Then he moved no more. I threw the body in the ditch, then some weeds on top of it. I returned home and dined well. What a little thing it was! In the evening I was very gay, light, rejuvenated, and passed the evening at the prefects. They found me witty, but I have not seen blood. I am not tranquil. August 31. The body has been discovered. They are hunting for the assassin. Ah! 
September 1. The tramps have been arrested. Proofs are lacking. September 2. The parents have been to see me. They wept. Ha! Huh. October 6. Nothing has been discovered. Some strolling vagabond must have done the job. Ah! If I had seen the blood flow, it seems to me I should be tranquil now. October 10. Yet another. I was walking by the river after breakfast, and I saw under a willow a fisherman asleep. A spade, as if expressly put there for me, was standing in a potato field nearby. I took it. I returned. I raised it like a club, and with one blow of the edge I cleft the fisherman's head. Oh, he bled this one, rose-colored blood. It flowed into the water quite gently, and I went away with a grave step. If I had been seen, ah, I should have made an excellent assassin. October 25. The affair of the fisherman makes a great noise. His nephew, who fished with him, is charged with the murder. October 26. The examining magistrate affirms that the nephew is guilty. Everybody in town believes it. Ah! Ah! October 27. The nephew defends himself badly. He had gone to the village to buy bread and cheese, he declares. He swears that his uncle had been killed in his absence. Who would have believed him? October 28. The nephew has all but confessed. So much have they made him lose his head. Ah! Justice! November 15. There are overwhelming proofs against the nephew, who was his uncle's heir. I shall preside at the sessions. January 25, 1852. To death, to death, to death. I have had him condemned to death. The Advocate General spoke like an angel. Ah, uh, yet another. I shall go to see him executed. March 10th. It is done. They guillotined him this morning. He died very well, very well. That gave me pleasure. How fine it is to see a man's head cut off. Now I shall wait. I can wait. It would take such a little thing to let myself be caught. The manuscript contains more pages, but told of no new crime. Alienist physicians to whom the awful story has been submitted declare that there are in this world many unknown madmen, as adroit and as terrible as this monstrous lunatic. End of The Diary of a Madman This recording is in the public domain.